folks, and welcome to The Eclectic Humanist, Season 2, Episode 2, where we begin our exploration of Lucretius's brilliant and beautiful poem on the nature of things in earnest. In this little talk, we're going to go over some of the salient points in Book 1, which lays out both his epistemology and his vision of how the cosmos actually looks, from which, of course, everything else later in the text naturally and logically follows. As Book 1 consists of about 1,100 lines of hexameter, obviously we're not going to go into detail with the whole thing. Rather, I'd like to think of this as sort of a sampler of his poetry and of his thought and of the body of thought of which his poem is actually the best record that we have. The vision of the cosmos and of human nature that he puts forward is quite different from most of what we might be familiar with from the various ancient thought worlds that provide much of the foundation of the Western intellectual tradition. I think as well that, though I won't necessarily be following a straight line through the text in any of these talks, I'd like to start at the beginning, because beginnings are important, both beginnings of worlds and beginnings of poems. So, here's the beginning of On the Nature of Things, as given in A. E. Stalling's wonderful translation. Life-stirring Venus, mother of Aeneas and of Rome, pleasure of men and gods, you make all things beneath the dome of sliding constellations team. You throng the fruited earth and the ship-freighted sea, for every species comes to birth conceived through you and rises forth and gazes on the light. The winds flee from you, goddess. Your arrival puts to flight the clouds of heaven. For you, the crafty earth contrives sweet flowers. For you, the oceans laugh, the skies grow peaceful after showers, awash with light. For soon as morning wears the face of spring, and the west wind is free and freshens, warm and quickening, the airy tribe of birds, O Holy One, is first to start heralding your approach, struck with your power through the heart. Then beasts, the wild and tame alike, go romping over the lush pasture land and swim across the river's headlong rush. So eager does each pant after you, so do they heed, caught in the chains of love, and follow you wherever you lead. All through the seas and mountains, torrents, leafy-roofed abodes, of birds and greening meadows, your delicious yearning goads the breast of every creature, and you urge all things you find lustily to get new generations of their kind. Because alone you steer the nature of things upon its course, and nothing can arise without you on light's shining shores, and nothing glad or lovely can be fashioned, I invite you, goddess, stand beside me, be my partner as I write the nature of things, these verses I am striving to set down, for Memmius, my friend, your favorite, whom you would crown with every honor and with everlasting accolades, more reason to endow my words with grace that never fades. Well, that's a really lovely beginning, isn't it? For one thing, it begins with an epic convention called the Invocation of the Muse, the Muse in this case being Venus goddess of love, and quite frankly also goddess of sex. This convention goes right back to Homer and probably before. In both the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer invokes the muse at the beginning of his poem and positions his narrator as being dictated to by the muse. That is, the invocation of the muse is definitionally the invocation of the divine. The declaration to the listening or reading audience that what you are saying is not merely a subjective position, but has some absolute or objective authority. This is the exact same trope or motif that we see in the prophetic books of the Bible, again, the invocation of the divine being used as a declaration of absolute authority. It's a common literary and mythological motif, and in that sense, perfectly conventional. Nothing here then, at least on the surface, to set a conventionally minded reader or listener on edge. On the other hand, we get to that point where he asks Venus to be his partner. That is, rather than taking dictation from the divine, he's positioning himself as working in collaboration with it. They're on a level. So even within a few lines, he's undermining the 
comfortable conventionality of that trope and repurposing it to his own philosophic agenda. Another twist here is that he attributes soul authority for the nature of things to Venus. That is, he presents her as an embodiment of the force that drives the cosmos. This isn't quite monotheism, but it also isn't quite conventional Roman paganism either. But this combined with the appeal to Venus to rein in or control the destructive forces of Mars, god of war, does invoke, through the images of the gods, a lovely mythological or metaphoric image of the cycles of creation and destruction, the perpetual cycles of creation and destruction, that he goes on to explore throughout much of the rest of the poem. That is, if the first few dozen lines of the poem function as an overture to a symphony, that is one of the themes that's laid out and developed at great length over the following six books. It's worth noting as well that Venus is praised for her association with sex and pleasure, both of which are presented as good things. That is, there's no notion of anything untoward in the physical act that leads to reproduction not with animals, and as we see a little later on in the text, not with humans either. There are no hang-ups here where sex is concerned. Sex in this thought world is not dirty, it's not sinful, it's not polluted. It's simply a fact of life. As are the death and destruction associated with Mars, things that can't be put off forever, but that we'd like to postpone for as long as we reasonably can. But of course, we can't postpone those things forever, can we? And this is where Memmius comes in. The poem is addressed to Memmius, who we find out later is not only a favorite to Venus, as in the lines I just read, but also afraid to die. That is, Lucretius is presenting this poem to a specific person. And I think the specificity here matters. And he's presenting it as a, as a work of consolation, as a way of bringing his friend around to being philosophically comfortable with the notion of death rather than philosophically terrified of it or viscerally or emotionally terrified of it. And the strategies by which he does this are really, really interesting, and I'm looking forward to exploring them with you. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. So let's return just to the beginning of the poem and, and think about what Lucretius is actually doing here. It begins with something that on the surface sounds conventional, and yet even within a relatively few lines is subverting that convention in multiple ways. This is how we have to read Lucretius. He's a very subtle writer, and he's subtle for a number of reasons, some of which he addresses explicitly later on in the poem. But the degree of irony that he invokes, or the levels of irony that he invokes in his writing, and through which we sometimes need to read to get at what the text actually says, which is never actually that far hidden anyways, is something that I think influenced Machiavelli and Bacon and other writers of the early modern period who had to cloak very subversive arguments in language that was at least superficially amenable to the dominant discourse and powers of the time because Quite frankly, they didn't want to die, or in Machiavelli's case, he didn't want to be tortured again. Or as Lucretius has it, as we flip forward to about line 922, but the goad of hoped-for glory strikes my spirit to inspire, and at the selfsame moment smites my heart with sweet desire for muses stirring up my thoughts. My mind abuzz, I blaze new trails across their mountain haunts. Among untrodden ways, I thrill to come upon untasted springs and slake my thirst. I joy to pluck strange flowers for a glorious wreath, the first whose brow the muses ever crowned with blossoms from this spot. Why? Because I teach great truths and set out to unknot the mind from the tight strictures of religion. And I write of so darkling a subject in poetry so bright, nor is my method to no purpose. Doctors do as much, 
Consider a physician with a child who will not sip a disgusting dose of wormwood. First he coats the goblet's lip, all round with honey's sweet blonde stickiness, that way to lure gullible youth to taste it, and to drain the bitter cure. The child is duped, but not cheated. Rather, put back in the pink, that's what I do. Since those who've never tasted of it think this philosophy's a bitter pill to swallow, and the throng recoils. I wish to coat this physic in mellifluous song, to kiss it, as it were, with the sweet honey of the muse. That is the purpose of my poetry. As you peruse my lines, try to keep your mind's attention while you start to understand the framework at the universe's heart. That is, Lucretius is aware of several things in terms of reactions his readers might have to his work. One is that he is quite knowingly stomping on sacred ground. He's working to take away the what he sees as the illusory comforts of false belief overseen by institutions who do not have the well-being of people as their central concern. But because he's stomping on the sacred ground, he knows he's going to offend. And if you're going to offend, the smart thing to do is to offend as politely as you possibly can to mitigate the offense, but also to give the potentially offended party a way of considering your argument without immediately having their hostility prickled. And there is potentially lots of hostility here to prickle. Let's go back to the beginning of the poem and see how Lucretius introduces the topic of religion and the gods. He says, for example, starting from line 44, for Godhead by its nature must enjoy eternal life, in utmost peace removed from us and far from mortal strife, apart from any suffering, apart from any danger, powerful in itself, not needing us, and both a stranger to our attempts to win it over and untouched by anger. That is, what he calls the Godhead, the divine, is eternally stable and eternally removed from human concerns. It's not concerned with us and not amenable to appeal by us. Or in other words, it is not moved by sacrifice, it's not moved by prayer, and it really doesn't care what we do. This is part of the basic Epicurean position that the gods, if they exist, simply have nothing to do with us, so we need not worry about them. But there's more. And I'll argue as we move through this series of talks, actually quite a lot more. For now though, let's skip to about line 80, where he pursues this line of thought a little further. One thing I am concerned about, you might, as you commence philosophy, decide you see impiety therein, and that the path you enter is the avenue to sin. More often, on the contrary, it is religion breeds wickedness, and that has given rise to wrongful deeds, as when the leaders of the Greeks, those peerless peers, defiled the virgin's altar with the blood of Agamemnon's child, Iphigenia, as soon as they had bound the fillet round her hair, so that its ends streamed down her cheeks, the girl became aware that waiting at the temple for her there would be no groom. Instead, she saw her father with a countenance of gloom attended by the priests who kept the blade well hid. The sight of people shedding tears to see her froze her tongue with fright. She sank to the ground upon her knees. It did not mean a thing for the princess now, that she had been the first to give the king the name of father. No, for, shaking, the poor girl was carried by the hands of men up to the altar, not that she was married with solemn ceremony, to the accompanying strain of loud-sung bridal hymns, but as a maiden pure of stain, to be impurely slaughtered at the age when she should wed, sorrowful sacrifice slain at her father's hand instead, all this for fair and favorable winds to sail the fleet along, so potent was religion in persuading to do wrong. This, of course, takes us back to Agamemnon's sacrifice of Iphigenia in return for getting a fair crossing of the Aegean at the beginning of the Trojan War, something with which the Romans would all be familiar, and something that by the time Lucretius is writing, and I think this is really important, would be recognized not necessarily as 100% historically reliable. 
That is, he's making an argument from a text whose, whose cultural authority is undoubted, but whose factual authority is dubious. And myth, of course, is always very dangerous when people start treating it as history. But we need to give some thought to why he's doing this. Why he begins his attack on religion with really what I think amounts to a weak argument and what he himself would probably see as a weak argument. Give that some thought as we're moving forward. One thing he does focus on, though, is the religious authority that is invoked and the religious type thinking appeal to the divine in return for worldly ends that is a very common part of many particularly nationalist rhetorics. How many millions of soldiers have died for God and country over the years? Or I'm suddenly thinking of a song by the great blues masters Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. The lyric goes, I know somebody told you that God was on your side. Well, I was told the very same thing, so you know somebody lied. That is, Lucretius presents religio, translated alternately as religion or superstition, as a human institution. And insofar as it wields the power of belief over human beings, he presents that as being ultimately destructive to human well-being. But he does, as I said, begin with a weak argument. And I'd be very curious to hear some of your thoughts as to why. As for the principal concern, the principal threat, the principal evil that religion inflicts upon the world and on the human psyche as far as Lucretius is concerned, it is specifically the threat of eternal damnation, a threat that still plagues many people in our own society, so something with which we should probably concern ourselves. As he says, sooner or later you will seek to break away from me, won over by doomsayer prophets. They can certainly conjure up for you enough of nightmares to capsize life's order and churn all your fortunes with anxieties. No wonder. For if men saw that there was an end in sight to trials and tribulations, they would find the power to fight against the superstitions and the threats of priests. But now they have no power to resist, no way to reason how, for after death there looms a dread of punishment for the whole of eternity, since we don't know the nature of the soul. That is, the power to tell another person that their behavior or their thoughts or their beliefs will condemn them to an eternity of suffering is a positive social evil as far as Lucretius is concerned, and here, quite frankly, I have to concur. And while the existence and nature of the soul, which is what he goes into next, is something that I will return to, right now I need to go back again and ask if he's not concerned with our relationship with the gods, as he's clearly not, if he's not concerned with how we relate to the divine, to some set of supposed transcendent principles, and he's not, what is he concerned with? What is the purpose of philosophy, or rather, what is the object of philosophy? Well, he answers that question around line 50. For what's to come... Open your ears, apply keen intellect far from cares to true philosophy, lest you reject out of hand the gifts that I've assembled for your sake, before you've fully grasped them. For I now begin to make my discourse on the lofty laws of gods in heaven above, and shall reveal the building blocks of all things are fashioned of nature's prime particles, from which she flourishes and grows all things and into which once more she makes them decompose. We term them in philosophy according to our needs, matter, atoms, generative bodies, elements, and seeds, the first beginnings, since it is from these that all proceeds. That is, by the time we get to line 50, we've gone from talking about the gods to talking about atoms. And much of Book 1 is concerned with the discussion of the nature of atoms and an argument for their existence as the smallest possible particles of matter. It is, of course, in this book where Lucretius lays out his foundational argument that the cosmos consists of nothing other than atoms moving in a void. There is, as he says towards the end of Book 1, no third thing. 
Now, I've noticed over several years of teaching this text that it's actually one of the texts to which I'm most likely to get a strong negative response from my students. And I think one of the reasons for this response is exactly this picture of the cosmos, the act of denial of anything supernatural, of anything transcendent, the assertion that the cosmos, as far as we can tell, does not contain anything other than matter in motion through a void. And of course, we know from special relativity that matter and energy are actually the same thing. This is what the E equals MC squared equation means. That this is still actually a pretty compelling picture of the cosmos as we observe it. And I think it's this reduction of all of reality, or at least all of reality that we can perceive to material stuff and material processes that many people even in the modern world have trouble with. One comment I often encounter in teaching this text is, or rather one question is, does this mean we're just matter? We're just material things. And that word just carries a lot of weight. And I'd like to hold that in mind. It carries a number of assumptions. It carries the assumption, perhaps, that we ought to be more. And it's, of course, for this reason that Lucretius justifies his poetic style the way he does. This is, for many people, even in the modern world, a bitter pill to swallow. But bitter as it is, let's take just a brief look at the argument. We'll start with atoms. And here, I think we need to distinguish between two different uses of the word atom. Lucretius defines atoms as the smallest possible particles of a given element, things that are irreducibly dense because they contain no void in them. That is, they are solid matter. He arrives at this position, of course, not through direct observation because atoms are too small. We can't see them. He knows that. And in this book, interestingly, he acknowledges the limitations of what we might call naked eye observation. This is actually worth pausing on. From about line 300 on, he discusses perception and he notes that all of our knowledge we acquire, we acquire through our senses, but he also acknowledges that there are limits to our senses, that there are things too small for us to see. And in acknowledging this, he also acknowledges that there's a limit to what we can actually deduce from naked eye observation. That is, Lucretius's epistemology is entirely observational, it's empirical. He doesn't proceed by abstract ratiocination. There are no forms for Lucretius as there are for Plato. There are no perfect mathematical objects as there are for Pythagoras. This intellectual humility before the limitations of our senses is something that the modern scientific method embraces and is also something that accounts for, I think, many of Lucretius's conclusions being factually incorrect while his methodology is still sound, while his epistemology is still sound. That is, wherever Lucretius goes wrong, I've found over years of reading the poem, it's not a flaw in his logic, it's a deficiency in his observations. And this is a deficiency that he would willfully acknowledge. He lets us know when he's extrapolating beyond what he can see. He lets us know when he's being tentative about the nature, for example, of particular atoms. Or rather, when he's being speculative. This, this honesty, this humility, is one of the great strengths of empirical epistemology. There is no claim to an absolute position, to absolute knowledge. We're always limited by what we can observe. Lucretius knows this. 
This being said, of course, there are inferences that we can reasonably make, and one of these is the existences of atoms as he has defined them. Or to articulate his epistemology clearly, let's take a look from about line 146 onward. This dread, these shadows of the mind, must be swept away not by rays of the sun, nor by brilliant beams of day, but by observing nature and her laws. And this will lay the warp out for us, her first principle, that nothing's brought forth by any supernatural power out of naught. For certainly all men are in the clutches of a dread, beholding many things take place in heaven overhead, or here on earth, whose causes they can't fathom, they assign the explanation for these happenings to powers divine. Nothing can be made from nothing. Once we see that so, already we're on the way to what we want to know. What can things be fashioned from? And how is it without the machinations of the god? all things can come about. This passage here is central to the entire poem. It's a rejection of the notion of creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. Lucretius posits that matter is eternal, that it was never created, that it's always been here. There are, of course, really only two possibilities. Either the cosmos in some form has always existed, or it began to exist. The cosmological argument, or rather the cosmological arguments, because there are many of them, going from Aristotle on forward, argued that it began and therefore had a cause, a prime mover. Lucretius simply takes the other option, because, well, we can see matter, we, we know matter's there. We can't observe the prime mover. This is an extra step that is inserted into the argument based really, I think, on faulty reasoning, specifically on something called a fallacy of composition, that what is true about the parts must also be true about the whole. Lucretius simply doesn't impose that step that can't be demonstrated. So for him, because nothing can spring out of nothing, matter must always have been here. But he also goes on, to argue from about line 210 onward that, as he says, nature does not render anything to naught. That is, no object, no matter how small, can come from nothing, and no object, no matter how small, can be reduced to nothing. We are here working with what I think I'll simply refer to as the philosopher's nothing, as opposed to the physicist's nothing, which I do plan on discussing at some point. The philosopher's nothing is an absolute void. The physicist's nothing is not that simple. And here as well, I think we should maybe distinguish between Lucretius's atoms and the atoms of modern physics, because they're not exactly the same. Lucretius, of course, argues that atoms, the smallest irreducible particles of a given element, contain no void in them. They are solid matter through and through, and for this reason are eternal. Well, we've known for a long time that the things we call atoms, the thing that we, the, the, the things that we've been calling atoms for a couple of centuries now, are not actually indivisible. By about the turn of the 20th century, we of course had discovered electrons, protons, and neutrons, and as the 20th century wore on, we realized that protons and neutrons each consisted of three what are called quarks. And if you know anything about string theory, it looks like quarks themselves may be composed of little vibrating things that physicists call strings. Now, Lucretius's intuition is correct. It does appear that either quarks and other particles such as electrons, neutrinos, photons, gluons, mesons, and what have you, or strings, if they exist, are probably the smallest or irreducibly small components of matter. So I don't want to get hung up on the words. This again is modern science 
having the capacity to observe things that Lucretius simply didn't have the capacity to observe. We've taken pictures of atoms, so actually we can see them. Lucretius could not. So we live in a different world, but his reasoning is, in principle, still pretty solid. And as long as I'm dragging contemporary science into this, which I'm going to do periodically over the course of these talks, I think I'd like to address something called the Planck length, which also is something that is consistent with Lucretius's argument that there must be a smallest thing. According to the current understanding of physics, that space is actually quantified. That is, it's sort of pixelated with the smallest meaningful unit of space, the smallest number in which it's meaningful to talk about anything in space being 1.6 times 10 to the negative 35th of a meter. Or to put it in a perspective that is still literally too small for the human brain to imagine, that is 10 to the negative 20th times the diameter of a proton. Anything smaller than this and the laws of physics break down, it is meaningless to speak of any space smaller than that. You might think you can imagine a smaller space, but you can't. You can't even actually imagine a space that small. You can do the math, but you can't imagine it. These are not the same thing. This is apparently as small as it's possible to go. Well, Lucretius, in Book 1, around line 551, has this to say, Furthermore, if nature had not set a boundary to the breaking down of things, then matter would already be so reduced by all the splintering of ages past that naught could be conceived at a given time, nor could it last to reach the prime of life, because it's faster, it is plain, for something to be broken down than to be made again. And thus, what had been broken down in all the time before through rough and tumble of yesterdays, nothing could restore in all the tomorrows left to come. But in reality, there's a limit fixed to the breaking down. Because we see each thing is made anew, and each thing at its given time, according to its breed, attains the flower of its prime. This isn't exactly the Planck length, but he's arguing for the logical necessity of there being a lower limit to how much things can be broken down. Because if they could be broken down infinitely, and if it's easier to break things down than to put them together, then the building up again would never be able to keep up with the breaking down if infinite breaking down were possible. And the Planck length, by the way, is also, it occurs to me just now, a really easy way of dismissing Zeno's paradox. And of course, where Lucretius argues that atoms, his definitions of atoms, are solid through and through, we actually now know that they are mostly void, don't we? A nice illustration I came across a number of years ago was this. If you imagine an atom to be about the size of a football stadium, with the seats in the football stadium, the bleachers, representing the orbits of the electrons, then the nucleus of the atom, which is where almost all of its mass resides, would be a housefly in the middle of the field. Everything else in an atom is empty. Or in other words, the unimaginably vast majority of what you are isn't even there. There might be a there there, but there's nothing there. And this, of course, brings us around to the void. Put simply, his argument is this. If there are irreducibly small particles, and it would appear that there are, then motion would be impossible if there were not also empty space. Or in other words, all stuff is made of atoms of irreducibly small particles, and the void simply is every place where atoms aren't. That's all. And for Lucretius, this is the entirety of the cosmos, because of course, as he argues, Atoms can be neither created nor destroyed, so therefore they must always have been here. And the fact that there is motion means there must also be something through which to move, that is, space, empty space, void. He offers several illustrations of why this must be the case. How water soaks into apparently solid substances, for example, say wood. 
how fish move through water. The water atoms must have some place to go or they wouldn't be able to move. Same with air. He actually discusses fluid dynamics in some really interesting ways. But because I've been talking for a little too long now, I think I'm not going to get into these just now. What I'll do instead is zip to the end of the chapter and his argument for an eternal cosmos. Because this is one of his most interesting arguments, I think. And it's worth spending a few minutes on before we move on from book one. Around line 955, Lucretius poses the question of whether matter and void are finite or infinite, bounded or unbounded. And to answer the question, he poses an interesting thought experiment. An experiment, by the way, that Giordano Bruno also poses in his wonderful work on the infinite and the world, which is one of the things that got him burned naked at the stake on February 17th of 1600. And the thought experiment goes like this. And we'll pick it up at 951. But since I've taught that atoms are as solid as can be and flit unconquered endlessly throughout eternity, come now, let us unfurl if there is any upper bound to their sum, and also as regards that void that we have found exists, place or space where each thing comes to pass, let's see whether its extent is bounded fundamentally, or else it opens measureless and fathomlessly deep. The universe must therefore have no limits in its sweep, in all directions, for if it did, then it would have a bound, and if it has a boundary, then something must surround it from without, so that the eye can follow only so far and no farther. And since we must confess that there is no thing beyond the universe, then it can have no border, and stretches limitless and without end. Whatever quarter you stand in makes no difference. Whatever place you are, it stretches out in all directions infinitely far. But let us say for a moment space were limited. Pretend that someone with a spear goes running to the very end and hurls the whizzing missile. Does the spinning spear then go flying afar along the trajectory of the mighty throw, or do you think that something thwarts it standing in its path? You must confess that one of these is true. You can't have both. Yet, each shuts your escape hatch and compels you to confess whichever one you choose, the universe is limitless, for whether there is something there to thwart the missile's flight so it falls short of its target or it passes on outside, it was not launched from any boundary. I'll persevere. Wherever you set the furthest brink, I'll ask about the spear. The result is that no last frontier can ever stay in place for possible flight forever pushes back the edge of space. That is, with Lucretius's imagined spear, whether something blocks it or whether something does it, if you throw it from the supposed edge of the universe, there must be something further ahead. Either the blocking thing itself, and therefore something on the other side of it, or no blocking thing, and therefore room to fly free. In 1600, these were very dangerous thoughts. But if space is infinite, then matter must also be infinite, mustn't it? Because if space were infinite and matter finite, there would be infinite space between each atom. Now, I can put this in actually a fairly concrete number for you, knowing now a little more than, of course, Lucretius knew, but still sticking pretty close to his logic. As far as physicists have been able to calculate, the average density of matter in the observable universe, and I have to say observable universe because we do not claim that the observable universe is the entire cosmos, but the average density of matter in the observable universe is approximately 5 atoms per cubic meter. So, in a cosmos of infinite space and infinite matter, what would be infinite would actually be that ratio, an infinite cosmos of 5 atoms to every cubic meter. But of course, with gravity acting on them, they would be drawn together into the patterns that we observe, actually. And how different is this world from the world proposed by Aristotle, with the Earth at the center 
and then a sphere for the moon and then Mercury and then Venus and then the sun and then Mars and then Jupiter and then Saturn and then the fixed stars, all of them in perfect spheres because as Aristotle describes in the metaphysics, which of course Lucretius knew very well, the sphere is the perfect shape and a cosmos created by a perfect being would have perfect shapes in it. That's a really sloppy summary of Book 10 of the Metaphysics, and it may be something to which I'll return a little later, and with a little more grace. In any case, I bring Aristotle up for another reason as well, not just to point out that he got the shape of the cosmos wrong but because he also posited that above the sphere of the moon, or the supposed sphere of the moon, the cosmos was composed of different stuff, of a different kind of matter, that the matter below the lunar orbit, or below the lunar sphere, was changeable, and the matter above the lunar sphere was eternal. That is, the cosmos for Aristotle did not work to consistent rules. Different rules applied below and above the lunar orbit. For Lucretius, the whole cosmos works to the same rules. Lucretius was right. And it was largely, I think, the argument for the consistency of rules in the cosmos above and below the lunar orbit, as much as the decentering of the Earth in the heliocentric model, that got some of the early modern scientific thinkers in trouble and in some cases killed. Because if the entire cosmos, which may well be infinite, is changeable, and if there is no middle to the cosmos, as Lucretius correctly observed, then there's nothing special about us, and we're not the focus of some imagined hierarchy. We're just matter in motion, doing what matter in motion does, with no guiding intelligence shaping it, and Lucretius absolutely dismisses the notion of intelligence guiding these things. He says, for example, for certainly the elements of things do not collect and order their formation by their cunning intellect, nor are their motions something they agree on or propose, but being myriad and many mingled, plagued by blows and buffeted throughout the universe for all time past, by trying every motion and combination, they at last fell into the present form in which this universe appears. That is, this brings us around to a really, really exciting proposition or possibility, especially when we consider that Lucretius around line 400 describes time or defines time not as a thing, but simply as a consequence of the motion of matter. That is, there is no past, there is no present for Lucretius. All that exists is the present. Well then, if time itself, according to this understanding, is not a thing, but rather a consequence, then there can be no inside time or outside time, therefore there can be no being transcendent to time. But, if, and here's, I think, the most exciting element of this entire first book, if the cosmos is eternal, if it's simply always been here, then the unlikelihood of something as complex as, say, the human brain, which is currently the most complex thing we've been able to observe in the universe, developing on its own, is not only possible, but quite possibly inevitable. That is, given infinite time, infinite space, and infinite substance, possibility becomes necessity. Everything that can happen eventually will and you don't need any imagined entity monkeying with the system from outside. This is beautifully elegant. It has minimal assumptions. It's parsimonious as fuck, and it works. And it is remarkably consistent with the best observations we have on the cosmos at the moment. And all of this is argued in beautiful poetry by the middle of the first century BCE. And all of this was almost lost a mere few hundred years later. Insert this bit at the end. 
But before I wrap up today's little talk, I'd like to point out that this poem begins sounding like an epic with an invocation to the muse, but I haven't named the hero yet. Lucretius has a hero in mind. I think he actually has two heroes in mind. And if we want to know who he is or who they are, we'll have to go back to line 62. When human life lay on the ground obscenely in full view, prostrate, crushed beneath the weight of superstition, who stretched down her head from heaven's realms and with her ghastly gaze loomed over mortal men, the first among them who dared raise his human eyes to her was Greek. The first man to withstand her, neither the myths of gods, nor lightning bolts, nor threatening thunder of heaven hindered him, but rather all the more they fired his mind's courage, so that he was the first man who desired to break the close barred gates of nature down. The vital force of his intelligence prevailed, and he advanced the course far past the blazing bulwarks of the world, and roamed the whole immeasurable cosmos in his mind and in his soul. In triumph he returns to us and brings us back his prize, to know what things can come about and what cannot arise, and what law limits the power of each with deep-set boundary stone, and therefore it is the turn of superstition to lie prone, trod underfoot, while by his victory we reach the heavens. The language here is suitably heroic. It's the, the language of the hero who goes beyond and discovers something and brings it back for the rest of us. It's the language of Odysseus plunging down to the depths of the underworld. It's the language of Gilgamesh going beyond the bounds of the mortal world itself and coming back with the knowledge that he brought there. It's the knowledge of Achilles ascending to psychological states, to spiritual states that the average human being will never know and coming back into the human fold, enriched with that, to share in narrative with the rest of us. This is the heroism of the intellect that sees the boundaries of superstition, the boundaries of imagined certainties, the boundaries of institutional authority, not as constraints, but as motivations to push past them, to go where ideological constraints say, thou shalt not go, and to know what the figments of past mythologies say, thou shalt not know. This is the intellectual heroism of the modern world. And the person of whom he speaks, of course, is Epicurus. And the other hero, I would argue, is the human intellect itself, freeing itself through empirical observation, the testing of evidence, the weighing of observable possibilities against each other that paves the way to what Lucretius calls the heavens. And insofar as this book lies behind Sir Francis Bacon's great instauration in which the scientific method, the modern scientific method, is first articulated, I would say the heavens here are not abstract. They're not the abode of imagined divine beings, singular or plural. The heavens here are footprints on the moon. They're rovers on the surface of Mars. They're satellites in orbit around the moons of Jupiter and the Voyager spacecraft, now billions of miles from the sun, and having recently, finally, left the solar system itself and ventured into interstellar space, that is the road that Lucretius is inviting us to follow. As we figure out how to live in this knowable cosmos. For now though, of course, as always, thank you for listening. If you would like to get in touch, I can be found at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com, at the Eclectic Humanist page on Facebook, and at EC Humanist on Twitter. And if you know anyone who you think might be interested in what I'm doing here, please share this. I'm going to shamelessly ask for your help in growing this channel. Most importantly, though, whoever and wherever you are, I hope you're enjoying this and I hope it's giving you something that is worth having. Until next week, please be well, listen to the doctors, try not to overthrow democracy, and be kind to each other. 